This episode of Serverless Chats is sponsored by CBT Nuggets and Fauna. On this episode, I chat with Patrick McFadden about the rise of data services. This is Serverless Chats, episode number 104. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Daly, and this is Serverless Chats. Today, I'm chatting with Patrick McFadden. Hey, Patrick, thanks for joining me. Hi, Jeremy. How are you doing today? I am doing really well. So you are the VP of uh, Developer Relations at Datastax. So I'd love it if you could tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and what Datastax is all about. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, mostly I, I'm just just a nerd with a cool job. I get to talk about technology a lot and um, work with technology. So Datastax, we're a company that was founded around uh, Apache Cassandra, just like supporting and, and making it awesome. Um, and that's really where I, I came to the company. Um, I've been working with Apache Cassandra for about 10 years now. I've been a part of the project as a contributor. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, mostly data infrastructure has been my life for most of my career. I did this in the dot-com era. You know, back in the back when it was really crazy, when we had dozens of users um, and <laughs> when that washed out, I, I'm like, oh, then real scale started. And, right. you know, th during that period of time, I was um, I worked a lot in, you know, just trying to scale infrastructure. It seems like that, that's been what I've been doing for like 30 years. It seems like <laughs> 20 years, 20 years. I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, right now, I mean, it's. I, I spend a lot of my time just working with developers on what's next in Kubernetes and, you know, I'm part of CNCF now. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just can't seem to get stay in one place. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I'm super interested uh, in the work that that uh, that uh, Datastax is doing because I have had the uh, pleasure slash misfortune of um, managing a Cassandra ring um, for for a startup that I was at, and uh, it was a very painful process. Um, but once it was set up and it was running, it wasn't too, too bad. I mean, we always had some issues here and there. Um, but this idea of taking a, a really good database, I mean, because Cassandra is great. Like, it's, a, it's a, an excellent, um, an excellent uh, data store. Um, but managing it is a nightmare. And finding people who can manage it is sort of a nightmare and all that kind of stuff. And so this idea of taking these services, and, and, and DataStax isn't the only one to do this, but to take these, these open source services and turn them into these hosted solutions um, is, is pretty fantastic. So can you tell me a little bit more, though, like what, what this shift is about, this sort of like moving away from hosting your own database to using databases as a service. Yeah, well, you kind of touched on something important. Um, you know, there, you you want to you want to take that power. I mean, Cassandra was a database that was built in in the scale world. It, it was built for to solve a problem, but it was also built by engineers who really love distributed computing, um, like myself. And um, you know, there was it's funny you say like, oh, once I got it running, it was great. Well, that's that's kind of the experience with most distributed compute, uh, distributed databases is it's hard to reason around having like, oh, I have a hundred mouths to feed now, and they're all, and if one of them goes nuts, then I have to figure it out. Um, but it's the power that power. It's like stealing fire from the gods, right? right. It's like, ooh, we could take the technology that Netflix and Apple and you know. Facebook use and use it on our own stuff, but you got to pay the price, right? You got to, the, the gods demand their payment. Well, <laughs> and that, that's something that we've been really trying to tackle at DataStax for a couple of years now, um, actually three, which is how, because the era of running your own database is coming to an end. You should not run your own database. And my philosophy you know, as, as a technologist is that um, proper, you know, really important technology like your data layer should just fade into the background and it's just mm. something you use. Um, it's not something you have to reason through very much. Um, right. There's lots of technology that's like that today. Like how many times have you, what was the last time you managed your own memory in your data, in your, in your code? Right. 
Right. <laughs> yeah. No. Thank yeah. God, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> no, and, I think, but I think that um, you make a really good point because you do have these larger companies like you know, like Facebook or whatever that are using, um, uh, you know, are using these technologies. Um, and you mentioned uh, data layers, which I don't think I've worked for a single company, or and I don't think I actually I started a I, I founded a startup one time, and we built a data layer as well because it's like the complexity of understanding the transaction models and and the routing. Especially if you're doing things like sharding and all kinds of crazy stuff like that, um, hiding yeah. that complexity from your developers um, so that they can just say, I need to get this piece of information or I need to set this piece of information um, is really powerful. But then you get stuck with these, um, you know, these data layers that are bespoke, right? And they're generally fragile and things like that. So how, how is it that you can take sort of data as a service and maybe get rid of some of that, um, I don't know, some of that liability, I guess? Yeah, and it's funny because you're talking about like sharding and things like that. These are things that we force on developers to reason through, mm. and it's just cognitive load. Like I, I have an app to get out, and um, you know, I have you know some business desire to get this application online. The last thing I need to worry about is my sharding algorithm. <laughs> and Jeremy, friends don't let friends shard. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. right. That's a good point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think we actually have all the parts that we need and it's just about, you know, it, th this is closer than you think. Um, you know, like look at where we've already started going and that is with APIs, um, using mm -hmm. REST. Now GraphQL, um, which I think is deserving its hot, its hotness is starting to bring together some things that are really important for this kind of world we want to live in. Right. You know, GraphQL allows you to federate data and collect things and do actual queries. There's a, it's a QL and why they call it graph. I have no idea, but it's, a, <laughs> but it gives you, it gives you this ability to have this more abstract layer. I think GraphQL will, here's a prediction is that it's going to, it's going to be like the SQL of working with data services on, on the, on the internet and, or, you know, during yeah. for cloud native applications. And, um, so what does that mean? Well, that means I just, I, I just have to know, well, I, I need some data and I don't really care what's underneath it. I don't care if I have this field indexed or anything like that. Um, yeah. and it's, it's that, you know, that that's pretty exciting to me because then we're just, we're writing apps at that point. <laughs> right. Yeah. And actually that's one of the things I really like about GraphQL too, is, just this idea that it's almost like a, um, I guess, like a universal data access layer in a sense, right? Because it does, I mean, you can be very, you still have to know it. You have to know what you're requesting if you're an end developer, but like it just, it makes it easier to request the things that you need um, and have those mutations set and have some of those other things sort of like uh, standardized across the company, but in a common format because isn't that another problem, right? Where it's like, I'm develop I'm working for company A, and I moved to company B, maybe, and now company B is using a different technology and a different bespoke data layer and some of these other things. So I think data as a service for one, maybe with GraphQL in front of it, um, is a great way to have sort of this alignment, um, you know, across across companies, or uh, I, I guess it just makes it easier for developers to switch and start developing right away when they move into a new company. Yeah, well, that and that this is a concept that I've been trying to push pretty hard, and I think, and it's driven by some conversations I've had with some uh, some friends that are, you know, they, they they're engineering leaders, and they have this kind of common desire. We we want to have a zero day dev, mm. and which is the first day that someone starts, they should be producing pr production code, and like that. Th I don't think that's crazy talk. You know, we could do this, but. I, there's a lot of things that are in front of it. And, and the database is one of them. You know, I think that's one of the first things you do when you show up at company X is like, okay, what database are you using? Um, what flavor of SQL or, you know, uh, gRPC or, you know, CQL, Cassandra query language? Uh, what's the data model? Quick, where's that big diagram on the wall with my right. ERD? You know, I got to go poorly, look at that for a while. How poorly <laughs> did you structure your Git repositories? Right? Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like all these things. And no, I just, you know, I, I, I would love to see a world where, you know, the, the most, the, the tr most troublesome part of your first day is figuring out where the coffee and the bathroom are. And then the rest <laughs> of the, is just total, Hey, I can do this. This is what I get right. paid to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that idea of zero day developer, I love that 
idea. And I know other companies are, are sort of, you know, trying to do that. But um, like, where is the what enables that? Right. So is it the is it getting that the the idea of having to understand something bespoke? Uh, is it getting that off of the table or not having to deal with the low level database uh, aspects of things? Like, is it I mean, because APIs, I had this conversation with Rob Sutter actually a couple a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the API economy and how everything is moving towards APIs um, and, and even data that was uh, around data as well. So is that is that the interface you think of the future that just says, look, you know, trying to interface directly with a database or, or trying to work with some other layer of abstraction just doesn't make sense. Let's just go straight from code right to the data with a very simple API interface. I, and I, yeah, I think so. And it's 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 this idea of data services because if you think of like if you're doing React or something like a front end code, you, I don't want to have a driver. You know, drivers are like right. a total impediment. Um, you know, it's like driver hell can be difficult at large organizations, like getting the matching right. Oh, we're using this database, so you have to use this driver. And if you yeah. don't, you have been, re you are now rejected at the gate. Um, you know, so it's using HTTP protocols, but it's also things like when you're using Re React or Angular, or, you know, Vue, whatever you're using on the front end, you have direct access. But most times what you're needing is just like a collection or an object. Right. And so you just do a get. I want I, I need this thing right now. I'm doing a, a pick list. I need a collection. Right. I don't need a complicated setup. Um and I <laughs> spend the first three days figuring out which driver I'm using and make sure my my Gradle file is just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So well, curious, that, I think that's it. Yeah, no, I'd be curious how you feel about um, ORMs or ORMs. Like, you know, I, for, certainly for relational databases, I know a lot of people love them. I I can't stand them. I think it adds a layer of abstraction and and just more complexity where, like, I just want access to the, to, to the database. Like, I want to write the query myself. And as soon as you start adding in all this extra stuff on top of it to try to make it easier, I don't know, it just seems to, it seems to mess it up for me. I, all right. So yeah, I think we, we have an accord. Um, <laughs> I'm really not a fan of ORMs at all. And I mean, this goes back to like Hibernate. Um, you know, everyone's like, ooh, Hibernate's going to be the end of databases. No, yeah. it's not. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it was the end of the database at the other side because it would create these ridiculous queries. You know, it's like, why is every query a full table scan? Exactly. Because that's the way Hibernate wanted it. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, uh, yeah. Um, I actually banned uh, Hibernate uh, at one company I was working at, I was a uh, chief architect there. And I just said, don't, don't ever put hibernate in our production. Right. Cause it, it was, I had more meetings about what it was doing wrong than what right. it was doing. Right. right. Yeah. No, so that there, sounds, yeah. is that a long answer? Like, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, no, that's, I've had the same experience where certain ORMs, you're just like, no, like you can't, there are certain things you're like, you can't, you can't do this because it's going to, one, I think it locks you in, in a sense. I mean, you, you, there's all kinds of lock-in in the cloud. And, and if you're using a data service or an API or uh, you're using something native in AWS or IBM Cloud or whatever, you're still going to be locked in in some way. But um, but I do feel like whenever you start going down that path of building custom things um, or, or forcing developers to get really low level, that just builds up all kinds of tech debt, right, that you eventually are going to have to work down. Well, it's, it's, it's organizational inertia, you know, it's uh, when you start getting into this, like uh, we are, we like when you st start using annotations and hibernate where <laughs> you're like, right. well, you're, you're just cutting through all the layers and, you know, and now you're way down in the weeds. Um, try to move that, you know, right. I, you know, I, there's a couple of companies that I've worked with now that are looking at the true reality of portability in their data stores like oh we want to move from one to a different you know like from a key value to a document without developers knowing well how do you get to that point <laughs> right yeah and it's just it that that's not giving access to those things first of all and um but you this is that tech debt that's going to get in your way you know we're, we've, we're really good i mean technologists we're really good at just racking up the charges on our tech debt credit card um <laughs> You know, especially whenever we're trying to get things out the door quickly. And I think that's actually one of the problems that 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 we all face. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever talked to a developer who was ahead of schedule and didn't have somebody breathing down their neck. You know, <laughs> um, Very true. You, you, you take shortcuts. You're like, we've got to ship this code this week. 
put, you know, skip right. the annotations and go straight into the database and get the data right. you need or something. You know, you, you make start making trade offs real fast. And what can we hard code that will just get us? Yeah. Back? <laughs> <laughs> Is it green? Ship right. it. <laughs> exactly. yeah. yeah. No, totally, totally green. Hi, everyone. I just want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, CBT Nuggets. If you're an IT professional or a developer like me, you know how important it is to constantly be learning new skills to keep up with the latest trends. Now, sometimes a blog post or a YouTube tutorial can get you started, but if you really want to upskill, nothing compares to professional training from experts you can trust. With CBT Nuggets, I have access to more than 400 courses and 4,000 hours of professional training. And with a 100% in-house training team, they add 40 hours of new training every week. Their courses feature topics ranging from building serverless apps with Lambda and DynamoDB to certification-focused training for AWS, Microsoft, Linux, and more. CBT Nuggets also offers virtual labs so that you can practice your new skills as you're learning them. They also have accountability coaching, which lets you talk to a real person to create a custom learning plan to set goals and keep you accountable. Whether you're a developer looking to sharpen your skills or a team looking to level up together, you can try CBT Nuggets for free for seven days thanks to their free trial offer. Just visit cbtnuggets.com slash serverless and sign up to get started. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit more about sort of, I guess, skill sets and things like that, because there are so many different databases out there, right? Cassandra is just one. And if you're a developer working, um, you know, sort of just at the, the driver level, I guess, with with something like Cassandra, it's it's not horrible to work with. It's relatively easy once a lot of these things are sort of set up for you. Um, you know, same is true of like MongoDB or, I mean, DynamoDB or any of these other ones where the interface to it isn't overly difficult. But there's always some sort of, you know, something you want to build on top of it to make it a little bit easier. But um, I'm just curious, like, in terms of learning these different things and switching between organizations and so forth, there is a cognitive load, right, going from saying I'm working on Cassandra to going to saying I'm working on, you know, DynamoDB or something like that. Like, there's, there's going to be a shift in, in understanding of how the data can be brought back, what the limitations are, like, you know, all, just a whole bunch of things that you kind of have to think about. And that's not even including managing the actual thing. That's a, that's a whole other thing. So, you know, hiring people, I guess, or hiring developers, like, how much do we want developers to know? I mean, do we, are you on board with me where it's like, I, I mean, I like understanding how Cassandra works and I like understanding how DynamoDB works and I, I like knowing the limits, but I also don't want to think about them when I'm writing code. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because um, you, you, Cassandra's, a, I mean, it's one of the things I really loved about Cassandra initially was just how it works. It was, you know, as a computer scientist, I was like, mm -hmm. wow, this is really neat. I mean, my, I mean, my degree field is in distributed computing. So of course I'm going to nerd out. On there you it. Go. But, <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have mass appeal because it's, it's doing the thing that people want. And that, I think that's, that's going to be the challenge of any, uh, properly built service layer. You know, I, I think I mentioned to you before we, before we started this bit, I work on a project called Stargate. Yeah. And Stargate is a project that is meant to build like a data layer on top of databases. And right now it's with Cassandra. Um, and it, it's abstracting away some of the, the harder to, to understand or reason things. For instance, with distributed computing, um, they, we were trying to reduce the reliance on coordination. Um, there's a right. great, uh, there's a great article about this by Pat Helland about how coordination is the, the last really expensive thing that we have in development, like memory, CPU, super cheap. I can rent yep. that all day long. Coordination is really, really hard. And, um, I, I don't expect a new programmer to understand, like, to reason through coordination problems, you know, oh yeah, you know, the just in time race conditions and things like that. Um, and that, I think that's where distributed computing, like it's super powerful, mm -hmm. but then whenever see, people see like what eventual consistency are, they freak out and they're like, I just want my SQLite on my data, on my laptop. Right. I'm, <laughs> it's very safe, but that, that's not going to get you there. That's not a global database. It's not going right. to be able to take you to, you know, a billion users. You know, right. Maybe you don't, <laughs> come on, don't, maybe don't cut your app be, short, but, Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, but, you're going to have a billion should, users. <laughs> you should strive for it, at least, is how I feel about it. But so so that's, I, I guess, the point I was trying to get to is that if, if the developers are the ones that you don't want 
learning some of this stuff. And there's ways to abstract it away, again, going like we talked about data as a service and APIs and so forth. Um, and I think that's where I would love to see things shifting. And as you said earlier, that's probably where things are going. Um, but if you did want to run your own database cluster and, or, and you wanted to do this on your own, I mean, you have to hire people that know how to do this stuff. And and the more I see the market, you know, heating up for for this type of uh, employee uh, or this type of person, there is very, very few specialists out there that are probably available, right? So, how do you even hire? How would you even hire somebody to run your Cassandra ring? They probably all work at uh, at Datastax. No, not all of them. There's a few that work at uh, Target and FedEx and <laughs> Apple, and, you know, right. the biggest Cassandra users in the world. <laughs> <Right>. Huawei. <laughs> we just found out lately that Huawei now has the biggest cluster on the planet. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, they just showed up at Apache Con and said, oh, yeah, hold my beer. <laughs> but I mean, you're right. It's uh, it's a specialized skill set. And um uh, this is, you know, one of the things we're doing at Datastax is we have, we, we'd feel, yeah, you should just rent that. And so we have Astra, which is our database as a service. Um, it's fully compatible with open source Cassandra. Um, if you don't like it, you can just take it over and use, uh, open source, but we agree. And we actually can run Cassandra cheaper than you can. Um, and it's just because we can do it at scale. And, right. uh, right now Astra, it's the, we the way we run it is truly serverless you only pay for what you need and that's uh something that we're bringing to the open source side of cassandra as well but it um we're getting cassandra closer to kubernetes internally so if you don't want to think about kubernetes if you don't want to think about all that stuff you can just rent it from us or you could just go use it in open source either way right. um but you're right i <laughs> i mean it should not be a 2020s skill set is get better at running Cassandra. I right. think those days should be leave it to, you know, if you want to go work at data stacks and run Cassandra, great. We, we're hiring right now. Right. You will love it. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. So the, the idea of it being open source, right? So this is, so again, I'm not a huge fan of this idea of vendor lock-in. Like, I think if you want to run on AWS Lambda, um, yeah, most of what you can do can only run on AWS Lambda, but changing the compute, um, you know, switching that over to Azure or switching that over to, you know, GCP or something like that, the compute itself is probably not that hard to move, right? I, I think, especially depending on what you're doing, setting up an entire Kubernetes cluster just to run a few functions is probably not worth it. I mean, obviously, if you've got a much bigger uh, implementation, that's a little different different. Um, but with data, data is just locked in, like no matter where you go, I mean, it is very hard to move a lot of data. Um, so even with the open source sort of flair, um, you know, that that you have there, um, you know, do you still see a worry about lock in from from a data side? Yeah, and, and it's becoming more of a concern with larger companies too, because options, you know, hashtag right. options. Um, that that was pretty uh, famous story a few years ago where uh, the CEO of Target said, "I am not paying Amazon any more money," and they moved, just like picked up shop and moved from AWS to G and Google Cloud, and like the CEO right. made a technical decision. <laughs> it was like everybody downstream had to deal with that, and you know I think that and. Now, it luckily targets a huge Cassandra shop and they were just like, okay, we'll just move it over there. But, um, the, the thing is, is that you're right. Uh, what I mean, I, and I, I love talking about this because back when cloud was first starting and I was talking about it and thinking about it, it's like, what did the clouds promise you? Oh, you get commodity scale of CPU and network and storage. Right. And, they want that's what they want to sell you because that's what they're building those big buildings in north virginia there are full of compute network and storage but the thing that they, they they know they need to hook you in and the way that they're hooking you in there's some services that are really handy they're great but really the hook is the data once you get into the database the bespoke database for the cloud yeah one of the features of that database is it will not connect to any other database outside of that cloud and they mm. know that um I mean, and this is why I really strongly am I'm starting to advocate this idea of, you know, this move towards data on Kubernetes is a way where open source gets to take back the cloud because now we're, de we're deploying these virtual data centers and using open source technology to create this just portability. So we can use the compute network and storage at, yeah. you know, a Google, Amazon, Azure, you know, on-prem, wherever, it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, but you, you need to think of like, all right, 
how is that going to work? If you, like if you, and that's why we're like, if you rent your Cassandra from data stacks with Astra, you can also use the open source Cassandra as well. And if you, if you, we aren't keeping you happy, you should feel totally fine with moving it to an open source workload. Yeah. And we're good with that. I mean, one way or the other, we would love for you to use a database that works for you. Right. And that, and so this uh, Stargate project that you're working on, is that the one that allows you to basically like route to multiple databases? It's, uh, that's the dream right now. It just does Cassandra, but there's some, been some really interesting, um, uh, there are some folks that are coming out of the woodwork that really want to bring their database technology to Stargate. And I, I'm, that's what I'm encouraged by. It's an open source project, stargate.io. And you can contribute as uh, any, any of the connectors for data underlying data store. But if we're using GraphQL, if you're using GRPC, if you're using REST, what the underlying data store is really somewhat irrelevant in the, in that case, you're, you're just doing gets and puts or gets and sets. Um, gets and puts. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> gets, sets, put, <sighs> you know, it's, whatever. It's a lot of words. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> that's what I love about standards, Jeremy. There's so many to pick from. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right, exactly. Which standard do you choose? Um, yeah. So th the, uh, cause that, that's an interesting thing, um, for me too, is just this idea of like, I mean, it, it would be great to live in a perfect little cloud where you could say like, oh, well, AWS has all the services I need and I can just, you know, keep all my stuff there, whatever. But I mean, best of breed services or, you know, again, like the cost of hosting something in AWS, maybe if you're hosting a Cassandra cluster there versus maybe hosting in GCP or maybe hosting it with you, uh, you said you could, you know, host it cheaper than, than those could or that we could host it ourselves. And so... um I do think that there is, you know, and again, we, we've had this conversation about multi-cloud and things like that, where it's not about, you know, it's not about agnostics, not about being cloud agnostic. It's about using the best, best of breed for any service that you want to use. And APIs seem to be the way to get you there. So um, I love this idea of, of the Stargate project because it just seems like that's, that's sort of the way where uh, it could be that standard across all these different clouds and onto all these different database. Well, I mean, right now, Cassandra, but eventually these other ones, um, I know that seems like a pretty powerful project to me. Well, in the time has come, you know, it's, it's right. cloud native. I work a lot with CNCF and cloud native data is, is, is a kind of an, an emerging topic. <laughs> it's so emerging that I'm actually, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a book an O'Reilly book on it. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, surprise, it just happened. <laughs> right, well. This just in. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I I can see that this is going to be the future. But, you know, when we build cloud native, like cloud applications, cloud native applications, we want scale, we want elasticity, and we want self-healing. You know, those are the right. three cloud native things that we want. And that just gives us a whole lot. Less. So if I if I want to crank out a quick React app, that's what I'm going to use. Right. Yeah. Um, and. You know, Netlify is a great example, or Vercel, or these, you know, they're, they're creating this abstraction layer. But, you know, Netlify and Vercel are both working, uh, they've been partnering with us on the Stargate project. And um, because they're seeing like, okay, we want to have that kind of a, that very light touch, developers just come in and use it in building cloud native applications. And, you know, where whenever you build, your, whenever you're building your application, it's, you're just paying for what you use. And, you know, that I think that's really key, not spinning up a bunch of infrastructure that you get a monthly bill for. Right. And that, Which <laughs> just seems that bill doesn't that seem crazy nowadays, like spinning, like actually like provisioning an EC2 instance and paying for it to run, even if it does nothing like that. I, that seems crazy to me. Um, there's there's uh, startups around the idea of finding the instance that's running, that's right. causing you money that you're not using. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is cra is crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. Um, all right, so let's let's go uh, a little bit more into uh, standards because you mentioned you know standards. Um, so there are standards <laughs> now for a lot of uh, a lot of things, and and again, GraphQL being a, a great example, I think. Um, but also from a database perspective, looking at things like you know, T-SQL, right? And and developers come into an organization and they're familiar with, um, you know, MySQL or they're familiar with PostgreSQL, whatever it is. Um, or, you know, maybe they're familiar with Cassandra or something like that. But I think most people, at least from what I've seen, have been very, very comfortable with the sort of T-SQL approach to um, getting data, right? So how do you bring developers in um, and start teaching them or getting them to understand more of that NoSQL, um, you know, that sort of NoSQL feel? 
I think it's already happened. It's just the the translation hasn't happened in a lot of minds. We know when we when you go to build an application, you're you're designing your application around the workflows your your application is going to have. You know, you're always thinking about like I click on this, I go there. I mean, this is where we you know we we wireframe out the application. At that point, your database is now involved, and I don't think a lot of folks know that. It's like at every point you need to put data or get data. Right. And um, what we and I think this is where we've taught could be, you know, any video building applications, which makes it really difficult is we like, no, 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 start with your data domain first and build out all those models. Mm -hmm. And then you write your application to go against those models. And I'll tell you, if I, I've been involved in a few of these uh, like uh, application boot camps, like JavaScript boot camps yeah. and things, they don't go into data modeling. It's just not a part of it. And really? I think this is what this is that thing where we have to acknowledge, like, yeah, we don't really need that anymore as much um, because we're just building applications. If I build a React app and um, I have a form and, I, and I'm managing the authentication and I click a button and then I get a profile information, I just described every database interaction that I need right. and it's I, and the objects that I need. And I'm going to put my user profile at some point. I'm going to click my ID and get a, that profile back as an object. Those are those are the interactions that I need. At no point did I say, and then I'm going to write select from <laughs> where. <laughs> no, yeah. I just need to get that data. No, and I and I love I mean I love thinking about data as objects anyways that that it, it makes more sense um, mm. rather than rows of you know spreadsheets essentially that you join together um, you know describing an object even if it's got nested data you know like in a document form or, or things like that I think makes a, a ton of sense um, but is it is SQL um, is it still relevant do you think I mean in the world we're moving into or it, I mean should our kids be you know should I be teaching my daughters how to write T SQL or would I be wasting my time <laughs> yeah uh, well yes and no <laughs> depends on what your what your kids doing um, I think that uh, SQL will go to where I, where it originally started and where it will eventually end, which is in data engineering and data science. And I mean, I still use SQL every once in a while, like, you know, big table, that sort of thing for right. exploring my data. Because that is a way, I mean, if for an analytics query or reporting data and things like that, SQL is very expressive. Um, I don't see any reason to change that. Um, <laughs> but this is a guy who's been writing SQL for a billion <laughs> years. Um, but I mean, that world is still is really moving. I mean, look at like, um, look at Presto and Snowflake and all of these, you know, Redshift, they all use Bigtable. They all use SQL to express yep. the reporting capabilities. But uh, then I think this is how we, we, you know, you and I got sucked into this is like, well, that was the database that we had. So we started using reporting languages right. to build applications right. <laughs> and, How'd that work out? <laughs> well, yeah. it, it certainly didn't scale very well. I can tell you that going back to sharding um, because that is always <laughs> something that was very hard to do. Hey, everyone. I'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Fauna. Fauna is a flexible, developer-friendly, transactional database delivered as a secure and scalable cloud API. With Fauna, think data, not database operations, as it provides serverless, multi-region, transactional database instances accessible all through simple API calls. It gives you the data safety and reliability you need without the operational pain all too common when managing your own systems. Fauna also offers a unique index document system that supports relations, documents, and graphs for unmatched modeling flexibility. Its query interface features complex joins and custom business logic, just like stored procedures, as well as support for real-time streaming and GraphQL. Its reliable, no-compromise platform features distributed data and a compute engine that is strongly consistent, fast, and highly resilient. You can trust Trust Fauna to protect your data and scale when you need to, with the assurance that it's grounded in academic research and Jepson tested. Also, because Fauna is an API, not a database as a service or a cluster that you have to manage, it's provisioning free, configuration free, and available instantly as a serverless utility. Once plugged in, it delivers limitless capacity and throughput, so your applications never break under unpredictable load. Fauna completely eliminates operational overhead such as sharding, capacity planning, data replication, schedule maintenance, and so much more. If you want to experience database nirvana, visit fauna.com and sign up for free. 
So I guess the, the, the you know, I, I get the point, right, that essentially, like, if you're going to be in the data sciences, and you're you need to actually analyze that data, and maybe you do need to do joins, or maybe you need to, uh, you know, work with big data in a way, um, that's a that's a specialized sort of aspect of it. And, and I think people could dabble in that if they were just regular developers, and they and they didn't want to go too deep. Um, but it sounds like, you know, the, the bigger uh, or, or the end goal here, right? Maybe altruistic um, is to just give people access to data. Like, so even if they don't know SQL or they don't know uh, something complex, like just make it so that whatever data is there, that anybody with whatever level is, they can consume it. Yeah, that's and and move fast with the thing that you're building. You know, right. um, there's actually I use a, a Facebook term, but Facebook does do this. They use a there's a internally there's a system called Occhio. Um, that provides gets and puts for your data, but it, it abstracts things like geographics and things like that. But, you know, the companies that are trying to move quickly, they understood, they understood this a long time ago. Right. Is if you have to reason through, am I doing a full table scan? Is that a efficient inner join? If you have to reason through that, you're not moving fast anymore. Right. Um, all right, cool. All right, so let's talk about Astra a little bit more, um, and uh, and this whole idea of because Astra is the is the serverless um, version, the hosted version, the serverless version of Cassandra, right? Through data stacks, right? Get that right? And you got it right, and uh, so it gives you full access. You you can do port ninety forty two if you still want to use a driver, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it gives you access via um, GraphQL, REST, and it, there's also a document API. So if mm -hmm. you just want to persist your JavaScript API or JavaScript, uh, and then pull it back out your JSON, um, it does full documents. Um, so there's it emulates what like a MongoDB or Document DB does. Um, but the, the important thing in it, this is the somewhat revolutionary side of this. And again, this is something that we're looking to put into open source is the serverless nature of it. It You only pay for what you use. And um, when you want to create a Cassandra database, we don't even call it a Cassandra database on the Astra panel anymore. We just create a database. You you give it a name, you click, yeah. and it's ready. And it it will scale infinitely as long as there's as long as we can find some compute network for you to use somewhere yeah. it'll just keep scaling and that's that's kind of that true portion of of serverless that we were really trying to make happen um and you know that for me that that's exciting because finally like all that power that i feel like i've been hoarding for a long time is now available for so much so many more people mm -hmm. um and then, like, if you do a million writes per second for uh, 10 minutes and then you turn it off, you only pay for that little short amount of time and it scales back. You're not paying the persistent charge right. forever. <laughs> now, I just, I'm just curious from a technical imp implementation because I'm thinking about, you know, or I'm uh -huh. having P PTSD or nightmares back of, of, of my of days running Cassandra. Um, and uh, <laughs> is so I'm just trying to think how this works. Is it a shared tenancy model um, or is there a way to do um, to do you know single tenancy if you if you wanted that as a service? I, under the covers, uh, yes, it is multi-tenant. And but we the way that we the way that we are created, so we had to do some really interesting engineering in time inside. So my my RCO is going to kill me if I talk about this. But hey, you know what, Jeremy, we're friends. We can do this. Um, he's like, don't talk about the underlying architecture. I'm talking about that. Um, the the thing that we did was we took Cassandra and we decomposed it into microservices mostly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's probably the, it's it's still Cassandra. Right. It's just how we run it makes it way more amenable to doing multi-tenant and scale in that fashion where you the queries are separated from the storage and things that are running in the background. Like if you're familiar with Cassandra, that's like because it's a, a log structure storage, it's you have to do compactions and things right. like that. All that's just kind of on the side. It doesn't impact your query, but it gives us the ability to like if. You know, you you create a database, and all of a sudden, you just hammer it with a million writes per second. There's enough infrastructure in total to cover it, and then we'll spin up more in the back to cover everything else. And then, whenever you're done, we retract it back. That's how we keep our costs down. But then the storage side is separated away from the compute side, mm -hmm. and the storage side can scale its own way as well. And so, whenever you need to store a petabyte of Cassandra data. You're just storing. You're just charged for the petabyte of storage on disk, not the thousand node cluster that you just created. Right, right exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 
I love that. I love. Thank you for explaining that, though, because that is every time I talk to somebody who's who's building a database um, or running some complex thing for a database, there's always magic. Somebody has to build some magic to make it actually work the way everyone hopes it would work. Um, and so if anybody is listening to this and they're like, oh, I'm just getting ready to spin up our own Cassandra ring, just think about these things because these are the really hard problems that is gr- that are great to have a team of people working on that can solve this specific problem for you and abstract all of that crap away. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it goes back to the Dynamo paper um, in uh, how distributed databases work, but it requires it requires that they have a certain like baseline, right? <laughs> it's like, and that they're all working together in some way. And it just Cassandra is a shared nothing architecture. I mean, they don't you don't have like a leader node or anything like that. Um, but you know, like I said, you know, because that data is spread out, you know, you, you could have these little intermittent problems that you don't want to have to think about. Just leave that to somebody else. Somebody right. else has got a Grafana dashboard that's freaking out. <laughs> like, right. Let them deal with it. But you can route around those problems really easily. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, all right, so a couple more uh, technical questions because I'm just I'm always curious uh, of how some of these things work. So if somebody signs up and they they set up this database um, and they they want to connect to it, you mentioned you could use the driver. You mentioned you can use GraphQL uh, or the REST API um, or the Document API. Is there a, what's the authentication method look like for that? Yeah, so it's it's using it's pretty standard thing with tokens. You you know you create your access tokens. Um, so when you create the database, you to define the way that you access it with the token. And then you, uh, whenever you connect to it, there's a, like if you're using um, JavaScript, there's a couple of collection libraries that, that just have that as one of the environment variables. Um, and so it's very, it's pretty standard for like connecting to cloud databases now where you have your authentication token and you can revoke the that token at any time. So mm-hmm. for instance, if you've mistakenly commit that into your git um <laughs> you know no, we've never I'm done not, that before uh, no judging you know <laughs> you can revoke it immediately right. but it also gives you like our back you know like the 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 controls over it's a read or write or uh, admin like if you need to create new tables and that sort of thing um you, you can give that level of access to whatever that um whatever that token is so um very simple model but then at that point you're just interacting with you know through um a rest call or using uh you know any of the http protocols yeah. or cql protocol right. yeah Right. And can you now can you create multiple tokens with different levels of permission or is it all just a token gives you full access? No, it's multiple levels of protection. And actually, that's probably the best way to do it. You know, having someone like, for instance, if your CI CD system has the ability to it should be able to create databases and tear them down. Right. Um, it, it, that, that would be a good use for that. But if you have, for instance, um, like a, a very basic application, you just wanted to be able to read and write. You don't want mm. it to change any of the underlying data structures. Right, um, right. That you know that that's a good layer of control, and you so you can have all these layers going on one single database. Um, or you can even have read only access too. Um, you know, for and I that's I think that's something that's becoming more and more common now that there's reporting systems that are you know on the right. side. Right. Yeah. Good. No, you can only read from the database. <laughs> <laughs> and what about like um what about like data backups or exporting data or anything like that? Yeah, we have a pretty rudimentary backup now and we will probably have we're working on some more sophisticated versions of it. It's it, data backup in Cassandra is pretty simple because it's all based on snapshots. Yeah. Um, because if you if you know data like Cassandra the database the data you write is immutable and that that's a great way to start when you come to backup right. data, <laughs> but um yeah we have some a rudimentary backup system now um but and you know where you have to if you need to restore your data you need to you know you need to put in a ticket to have it restored at a certain point um I don't personally like that as much I I like the self service model and that's what we're working towards um okay. and. With more more granularity, um, because with snapshots you can do things like snapshot. This is the thing. One of the things that we're working on is doing like a snapshot of your production database and restoring it into a QA cluster. So nice. that you know, like, works for my house. Oh, try yeah. it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's awesome. Um, no, I, so this uh, this is amazing, and I and and I love I love this idea of of just just taking that pain of managing a database away from you. I love the idea of like 
just make it simple to access the data. Don't create these, you know, uh, these complex things where people have to build more. And if people want to build a data access layer, the data access layer should maybe just be enforcing a model um, or something like that and not having to figure out, oh, you know, if it, you're on this shard, we route you to this particular, you know, port or whatever the heck. Like all that stuff is just insane. So, um, so yeah, so I, I mean, maybe go back just to uh, kind of the idea of, of this whole episode here, which is like, you know, just stop using databases, right? Like start using these data services yeah. because they're so much easier to use. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure there's concerns for some people, especially when you get to larger companies and and you know uh, you have all the compliance and things like that. I'm sure I'm sure uh, Astra and DataStax, um, you know, is, it has all the compliance things and things like that. But like, yeah, I mean, just any final words, like advice to to people who might still be thinking databases are a good idea. <laughs> well, um, I have an old 6502 on a breadboard, which I love to play with. It doesn't make it relevant. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was a little, that was a little catty, wasn't it? Relevant, um, <laughs> but, but, but point well taken. I, I, I totally yeah, get what you're saying. It, I mean, it's, it's, I think that it's, what do we do with the next generation? And this is one of the things, uh, this will be the thought that I leave us with is like, we always, we're, it's incumbent on a generation of engineers and programmers to make the next generation's job easier, mm. right? We should always make it easier. So this is our chance, you know, if you're currently working with database technology, this is your chance to not put that pain on the next generation, right? you know, the people that'll uh, go past where you are. And so this is how we move forward as a group. Love it. Okay. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for sharing all this and telling us about uh, DataStax and Astra. So if people want to find out more about you or they want to find out more about uh, Astra and DataStax, how do they do that? All right. Well, uh, plenty of ways at www.datastacks.com, of course, and um, astra.datastacks.com. If, if you just want the good stuff, <laughs> cut the marketing, go to the good stuff, <laughs> astra.datastacks.com. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Patrick McFadden, and I'm, I'm everywhere. Just If you want to connect with me on, on LinkedIn or on Twitter, um, I love uh, you know, connecting with folks and finding out what you're working on. So please feel free. Um, I get ton, I get more messages now on LinkedIn than anything. And it's, yeah, great. it's been picking up a lot. <laughs> I know it's kind of crazy. LinkedIn is, is really picked up. It, it, it's, uh, I'm good with it. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's I'm a, really good with it. It's a little bit better, a <laughs> uh, little bit better format maybe. Um, so you also have, you, we, we mentioned the Stargate project. So that's just stargate.io. Um, we didn't talk about the K8 Sandra project. Is that yeah, how the you Kate say Sandra that? project. Kate yeah. Sandra. Kate Sandra. Is that what you say? Kate Sandra. Isn't that, isn't that a cute name? <laughs> <laughs> it's K eight S S A N D R A dot I O. Um, right. What, what is what's that again? That was that's the idea of moving every, the Cassandra onto uh, Kubernetes, right? Yeah, it's it's not Cassandra on Kubernetes. It's Cassandra in Kubernetes. In Kubernetes. So it's like oh, in in concert and and working with how K Kubernetes works. Yeah. So it's a it's using Cassandra as your default data store for Kubernetes. Um, it's a, uh, it's a very, actually that's, that's a one, another one of the projects is just taking off. Like KubeCon uh, was last week from, from where we're recording now and, or two weeks ago. And it was just, it was a huge hit because, uh, you know, again, it's like, Oh, Kubernetes makes my infrastructure to run easier. Right, and right. Cassandra's hard. Put yeah. those together. Hey, I like this <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, awesome. So yeah. Cool. All right. Well, if uh, if anybody wants to find out about that stuff, I will put all of these links in the show notes. Thanks again, Patrick. Really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. And that's this week's serverless chat. I want to give a huge thank you to Patrick McFadden for being my guest this week and to our sponsor, CBT Nuggets and Fauna. If you want to check out the show notes and a full transcript of this episode, you can find them at serverlesschats.com slash 104. For more serverless chat, subscribe, sign up to be an insider, check us out on YouTube, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can connect with me on Twitter, at Jeremy underscore daily. And if you want to keep up to date on everything serverless, make sure you subscribe to the Off by None newsletter at offbynone.io. Thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to chatting with all of you again next week. <laughs>